today I want to take a few moments to cover the topic of how much power do I really need. Um, there's a great misconception uh, about uh, how big of an amplifier or how many watts it needs. So I'm going to break it down into pure science. Um, most speakers um, will give it a, a rating of 89 dB for one watt. Um, this is pretty much the average of what most speakers will do. Now, behind this, you have to understand that this is measured at three feet. So clearly, when you're talking about the power you need, um, the size of the room also plays into this. But we're going to try to keep it simple for the moment. But for each three decibels more in sound pressure, the power doubles. Now, um, 90 dB is a car horn at 10 feet. When we talk in average conversation, we're typically about 65, maybe 70 dB of sound pressure, okay? So when we're presenting uh, systems to customers, one of the questions that always comes up is how loud is loud? And I'll play a system and slowly increase the volume so I get an understanding of really what sort of volume do they find comfortable. And some people want the Grateful Dead volume uh, where we've actually had to go out and get pro speakers. Um, there are other people that um, if it was louder than the meow of their cat, it was already too loud. There's a whole range. And this is all personal, and that's fine. But watch what happens. We now start increasing the volume. 4, 98. Uh, we're now at 8, 101. We're now at 16, 104. We're at 32, 107 decibels. Now at 64, 110, which is pretty loud. We're now at 128, and we're talking about continuous um, power being needed. And of course, if you're really a bug crusher, uh, let's go to 113, and now we're at 256. So what happens is while your sound pressure um, is going up in a linear fashion, your power consumption is going up logarithmically. Now, hearing is much like your eyesight. It operates the same way. So if you go from, let's say, a 25-watt bulb to a 60, wow, that's really a difference in brightness. But if you go from a 60 to a 75, it's a little brighter, and you go from 75 to 100, it's a little brighter. So um, our hearing and our sight um, reacts um, kind of the opposite of logarithmically uh, because it takes a, a lot more to really make it appreciably brighter. Um, so it makes it a lot more to make it appreciably louder. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to stop for a minute and I'm going to draw a couple other things. So now we're going to get into amplification itself. And I'm not going to get into the different classes of how they get there. What I want to talk about is the difference between um, power ratings between um, stereo amplifiers, audio amplifiers, and the home theater products. And one of the things that most people don't realize is that a long time ago, the Federal Trade Commission decided we needed to come up with a standard to um, level the playing field. Um, of how to rate things. So one of the things they did is they would connect an amplifier to an 8 ohm test load resistor. Um, that was considered more or less the average or standard impedance of a typical um, dynamic reactive loudspeaker. Then the second thing they would do is that the manufacturer would have to specify how much um, total harmonic distortion they were willing to accept in this sort of power rating. So if you were willing to uh, tolerate higher distortion, 
well, you could get a greater power rating. Um, other people, um, like Yamaha, went at it with such um, a different approach, particularly in the early series, that they could drive total harmonic distortion down to 0.0002% or something like that. The problem is they used a lot of negative feedback, um, which resulted in pretty much a muffled sound. Now, so we have an 8 ohm test load resistor, we have total harmonic distortion, then we have the power rating, how many watts per channel you're willing to give it, okay? And all of this would have to survive a one hour full output test. So um, if you specified these things, you know, the distortion, the power, and the one hour, and it blew up, well, then it failed this test. Now, this was applied to all stereo amplifiers um, or stereo receivers. Um, I'm going to get into it in a second as to why this doesn't even work. But more importantly, you have to understand that this applies to stereo products. It does not apply to home theater receivers. So the power ratings given to a lot of products um, for home theater don't even go through these riggers. Um, that's why you can have stereo amplifiers rated, let's say, 100 watts per channel, but you can find, uh, uh, at a certain price, but you can find a home theater receiver that has 150 watts and seven channels for half the price because they're not having to meet these standards. Um, early in the game of home theater receivers, um, by the way, what they had to do is do a sweep from 20 um, to 20,000 hertz. I forgot to put that in earlier. Um, but you saw early home theater receivers cheating, uh, so they would spec it at 40 to 20,000 hertz. Um, so that they could have a higher power rating. Um, so it was a lot of games going on, but keep in mind that um, there's a distinct difference in the rigors that stereo amplification has to go through as opposed to home theater receivers. So that's why there was kind of a really, this really big misnomer about this. Now, I want to go uh, into why um, the 8 ohm test load doesn't work. Um, and how that impacts in the power rating and distortion. So then the magic question comes up, you know, well, if we're using FTC regs, you know, why do power amplifiers sound different or why do some amplifiers have a problem driving one speaker versus another? Well, as we said earlier, you know, they want a 20 to 20,000 hertz sweep with a static 8 ohm load, okay? So if you, if you were to do a, a simple little graph, you know, um, here's, you know, the impedance and it's just this flat line through the frequencies. Well, the truth of the matter is most speakers have an impedance curve that the amusement parks would like to build as a ride, okay? So the impedance may change dramatically by frequency. Um, we've seen speakers that have as little as 2 ohm impedance at the 20 cycles, which means it's, um, it's going to require an enormous amount of power. And it also prevents a wicked load on the amplifier itself. And it may not have enough heat sinking to it to dissipate the heat that's going to be generated on the amplifier. And so you basically, you know, kiss that one goodbye. So this is part one of the problem. So you may hear the expression from some people that it's a difficult speaker to drive, which is why they're making recommendations on different power amplifiers. So a bit of that has to do with the impedance curve. The other thing that um, a lot of people don't pay attention to um, is the nature of the speaker itself. Um, most speakers um, that people buy have voice coils and cones, um, as opposed to something like a Martin Logan, which is an electrostatic panel. Um, this is a different type of load. So when you're talking about cone drivers, you have um, a characteristic 
known as a reactive load. And what we're talking about is the amplifier is telling a driver to move and you have a voice coil inside of a magnetic structure uh, and it moves, but there are different commands given to that driver. So there are some points where the driver wants to keep moving forward when it's being told to do something different. And at those instances, it actually generates electricity. Um, I use a milliamp here, here and just push on a speaker cone and you can actually measure the fact that a voice coil in a magnetic structure is in fact a generator. And so how an amplifier uh, itself deals with this reactance or reactive load can vary very dramatically um, between amplifier designs. Some are far more competent than others. Um, and this plays into the power rating because um, it may be rated well, but it may not be able to deal with the electrical current that's being punched back at it. And this is just what happens. So this also contributes to why um, speakers sound very different. Um, when you start talking some of the panel designs, um, whether there are, they are a, um, an electrostat or, or an isodynamic, um, then you're dealing with a capacitive load. Um, and how an amplifier likes to deal with that can be very different again. Um, some of the early um, Class D amplifiers um, had a real major problem with a capacitive load. Um, and so they, did, they just sounded like, you know, you, you bought yourself a giant AM radio because they just couldn't deal with this. And they've gotten far better than they used to be. Um, so it's not... Um, disparaging class D. It was, it was the beginning and the learning curve of, of how to deal with the difference in what was presented. Um, so when we talk about power ratings, there's a lot of things going on. And, um, but uh, a well-trained dealer will uh, recognize with what he's got going on with the speakers, what he's got going on with amplifiers, uh, what the quality of the amplifier is, how large of a room you have, how loud you want to play, uh, which affects how much power you need and the circumstances that are going on. Um, it's not to say that um, the price of an amplifier is an indication of what, how it will handle any of this. Not at all. That's, that's where specialty knowledge of what the product does or cannot do is very important. This is also one of the reasons that a lot of reviews uh, of a given amplifier or a given um, product, you know, home theater product, is um, very uh, tenuous because you don't know what there's, what's going on within the system. And uh, they can come up with all sorts of imaginative descriptions, either praising or bemoaning the performance of a product when its setup or application is praiseworthy or completely inappropriate. I've seen reviews of fine products get absolutely burned because of what they've used in combination, and it, it ignores some of these factors that I'm talking about. So hopefully this little um, quick lesson uh, to understand how much power do I need will provide you with some knowledge and some good questions. So when you're talking with somebody about your needs, uh, they have a better picture, and these are questions you need to raise. I'm going to raise, show one more thing, and we'll let it go. When we talk about the size of the room and its impact upon how much power you need in relation to the volume you want to play at, you have to understand that sound and light are just simply different frequencies for which we have different sensors, but their behavior is identical. So I'm gonna use a flashlight, and when I'm real close here, it's very bright and very dense. But as I pull away, you can see that it begins to dissipate in brightness. Sound does the exact same thing. So as you're talking a very large room, uh, what can happen at three feet in the measurement, if you're talking a moderate room that's, um, let's say 15 by 20, that's one thing. But if you start talking um, 25 to 40 feet with vaulted ceilings, 
everything changes in terms of sound pressure. So your choice of power amplification um, is not only whether it's capable of driving your speakers appropriately, but will it play it at the volume you want in the environment that you have? And these are all equations you have to watch out for. Um, some rooms will also be a lot more live, more reflective than others. Some rooms may be heavily damped with furniture and um, all sorts of draperies and things like that. That plays into this factor as well. Uh, so don't be ashamed when you go into uh, to listen to any product to start out with that simple question, how loud is loud? So you begin to at least get a reference of the sort of power you might need. And then you start getting into the questions of the quality of the power you're thinking about buying in relation to the speakers you wish to use.